you very much for the invitation. It's a big pleasure and honor for me to uh, speak uh, to you about Ukraine. I'm very happy that despite the weather and the uh, mid of July, you all made it here. I, it says a lot to me that there is interest towards my country. Um, I think that uh, I will talk a little bit about domestic developments in Ukraine and then go to foreign policy uh, and then uh, we'll conclude about elections that are coming in October in Ukraine. Um, speaking about today, today is a memorable day. Uh, the president, the fourth president of Ukraine is celebrating his 62nd birthday and uh, it's a person who could become a hero of uh, Ukraine uh, as he could bring stability and uh, also uh, set the, the right course uh, of, for the country. Uh, when President Yanukovych was coming to power, he actually promised stability and he said that he would unite East and West around a certain project. I think over the two years he did succeed in that. Unfortunately, um, the East and West are now united in, his, in their disliking of him rather than uh, around certain other project. And I will try to tell you, basically to walk you through this last two years uh, leading to today, why Ukraine is a gray zone, uh, unfortunately, and uh, where it may go within the next few years. So in 2010, we had free and fair presidential elections that brought to power Viktor Yanukovych. Um, and uh, unfortunately, very fast after that, uh, Ukraine started going the wrong direction. Uh, we see that Ukraine is not scoring well on in international ratings, uh, be that the Freedom House, uh, Nations in Transit Freedom Index, be that the World Bank uh, Ease of Doing Business uh, report, be that Transparency International, where Ukraine is almost uh, sadly sitting on the 152nd uh, place out of 183 countries, both in terms of corruption and in terms of ease of doing business. Uh, in 2010, in autumn, we saw local elections that were not uh, compliant with international norms uh, later on, we saw the constitutional overhaul, uh, which basically uh, meant that uh, Ukrainian constitution, uh, with Ukraine being more uh, of a parliamentary republic, was returned to the constitution of the 90s, um, with president gaining again more power. Uh, but that was done through the constitutional court, uh, which was under control of the president. Uh, the judiciary was also put under control uh, of the presidential administration and we saw that president people were put in key positions uh, in, uh, in the administration from central bank to ministry of interior and, and other ministries. Uh, we also saw a very sad development after the Orange Revolution that first time uh, Ukrainian media started self-censorship uh, just basically uh, for owners being afraid of um, a prosecution from the administration. There were no direct um, demands from the administration as it was in the 90s, but the self-censorship was a very uh, new development. We also saw that the economy was not doing well. As you probably know, Ukraine was among the most hit economies uh, of the crisis of 2008-2009. Uh, it did recover slowly with the help of IMF and the activities of the government. But uh, at the same time, uh, we saw that the reforms that were started, they benefited mostly the big businesses, the oligarchs close to the president and his family rather than ordinary people. Uh, and for instance, an interesting development that the president's family started uh, enriching itself over the last two years was, for instance, president's son, uh, growing his wealth 18 times in just one year. Uh, and the last sad development is that the police and security forces are gaining more power, but also more budget, and that raises a big question uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the lucky, the, the healthy development that you mentioned was the Euro 2012, which again, um, with a lot of efforts from the government, not always successful, I think that it was a good sign that it was successful because uh, for me it was a sign of Ukrainians basically stepping in uh, and being those hospitable people who welcomed the European uh, fans. 
uh, and that was again about the people's power, which I will talk a bit later. So why all these sad developments? Why Ukraine after the Orange Revolution, a hopeful of the European Union, a hopeful of the Western world, why did it go this way? Uh, my reading of this is simple, that basically the president's uh, vision uh, for Ukraine is not of a statesman, but more of a clansman, with his family being a center of his thinking. Uh, we saw that, as I said, that the, there was a, an enrichment of his family members and himself. We saw this consolidation of power, we saw the distribution of assets first for oligarchs close to him, but now more to family. And we saw tightening of control in all, uh, almost all public spheres. I would not agree with those who say that Ukraine is now a Belarus or on the way to Belarus. It's a very, very much of a development in, of its own, but it's quite a worrying sign. Now I'll move to the foreign policy. Um, as I said, the, the title says Ukraine is an East and West and that Ukraine is a grey zone. That's basically where Ukraine again ended up uh, with, the, with the help of administration. When Yanukovych came to power, he said that foreign policy will be pragmatic, that it will be based on national interests, and it will be not more, no more about dreaming uh, European dreams, but building Europe at home. In reality, at the beginning, it was more about corporate interests, which basically interests of the oligarchs close to him, and now it's about family interests that are growing within, uh, uh, within the country. Again, the grey zone is about uh, reactionist foreign policy uh, quite often, and often misreading uh, the partners. I will talk about three partners because the West, the Ukrainians don't see the West uh, as a homogenous, uh, obviously, actor. Uh, the US would be perhaps the most important uh, foreign policy partner, and it's perhaps the most respected partner by the, uh, by the Ukrainian administration. Um, obviously, there were a number of uh, steps towards the US, uh, like uh, Ukraine giving up enriched uranium, or uh, Ukraine was participating in NATO operations, or uh, US companies got uh, access to uh, extraction of gas on Ukrainian territory uh, just recently. And most of these actions were made uh, to basically shut up the US on democracy on the problems with democracy in Ukraine. And the belief in Kiev is such that when we give all the things to the US administration, they will simply forget about values, about their, uh, their um, <coughs> respect for democracy. Um, now moving to Russia, it's, it's the partner and competitor, which has a very long history of difficult relations with Ukraine. Uh, obviously, um, it's perhaps the most feared partner by the administration, and um, the initial desire when Yanukovych came to power was to get uh, to change the contract uh, that was signed in 2009 on gas supplies from Russia and uh, to get basically cheaper gas, uh, and on the other hand to be left alone. Um, the talks uh, continue for two years with very little result. We saw that the Ukrainian administration tried to give gifts to or presents to the uh, uh, to, to the Russian administration. First of all, by declaring Ukraine as a non-bloc country, which basically meant that we would not aspire to become a member of NATO. Uh, and then the second was the um, uh, extension of the Black Sea Fleet lease uh, for for the next uh, few decades. But again, these concessions led to nowhere, the, the contracts are not uh, revised. And basically, uh, this, the last one was what you mentioned, uh, the language law, which was adopted by the parliament last week. It's not the only reason, Russia is not the only reason for the adoption of this law, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. But uh, basically, the assumption was that before the meeting uh, of President Yanukovych and President Putin on July 12th, uh, again, to discuss gas issues and other uh, bilateral issues, that would be a nice present. My, my reading is that it will not help uh, to solve the gas problem, but uh, that's, that, that has been done. On the bigger demands of Russia, which is Ukrainian pipeline and, and uh, storages for gas, and the membership of Ukraine in the Customs Union, uh, I don't think that the Ukrainian administration is ready for that. 
for very pragmatic reasons because it will not be good economically for oligarchs and the family in the short run and in the long run it will not be good politically for the president <coughs> and his family. So I would not, I would perhaps calm down those who are afraid to lose Ukraine to Russia. I think that the, the most scary uh, situation is if we lose Ukraine to this gray zone. Uh, than to to uh, to Russia, uh, I would say that perhaps relations with Russia will always be difficult. But with this particular administration, they will not get easier, despite all the hopes initially when Yanukovych came to power. Uh, but again, to remind that Russia is perhaps the only partner with which Ukrainians uh, have real negotiations, and uh, with the misinterpretation of Russia's intentions and desires we see that it leads nowhere because Russia doesn't want to agree with the small gifts. It wants a bigger, uh, a bigger uh, gift. Uh, now moving to the European Union. Um, for a long time, the European Union was declared as an ultimate goal of every Ukrainian administration. And uh, as was mentioned here, the Ukrainians started negotiations on the association agreement uh, and deep and comprehensive uh, free trade agreement in 2007-2008. Uh, the negotiations were quite painful, uh, basically for both sides. First of all, for the EU, it was the first time when such a broad and comprehensive agreement was negotiated with a third country. Uh, for Ukrainians, it meant that uh, if agreement is signed and implemented, Ukraine would be politically associated and economically integrated with the European Union, which meant taking on a lot of EU acquis in various spheres, uh, and it wouldn't be only about uh, just freeing trade in goods, but it also basically uh, freedom for movement of services and uh, and capital and lesser extent of uh, mobility of people, but still it would it would integrate Ukraine significantly significantly into the European Union. In parallel, there were also very uh, positive developments on Ukraine joining energy community of the European Union with the Balkan states. Uh, it's been one year of Ukrainian membership, but unfortunately Ukraine didn't move uh, much on in implementing its commitments. Ukraine is negotiating an open sky agreement with the EU, which would allow uh, freer, uh, f more free travel um, for the people to and from Ukraine. Ukraine got uh, budget support for reform initiatives. And obviously, Ukraine started. Ukraine signed visa facilitation agreement and uh, started a visa-free uh, dialogue with the European Union. Um, I think that uh, the the package that the EU offered to Ukraine was quite generous, and it could work if the administration and the leadership would really want to use these tools that are offered. Uh, but unfortunately, not, neither those that are already given nor those that may be given will work. Uh, and I think that the, here the problem is for the EU, EU27, uh, is that the, the EU is uh, basing its policy on the assumption that Ukraine is like us, like Poland, that it wants to integrate. And uh, unfortunately, that's, that's a wrong assumption. People of Ukraine may want to be European, may they want, they may want to be democratic, but unfortunately, the elite and the leadership uh, do not want to give up today's pleasures for the sake of country becoming more close to the European Union. So um, the problems with Ukraine started obviously not with the prosecution of opposition; they started with the bad local elections, constitutional overhaul, and others. But the reaction, strong reaction, came from the European Union. Uh, as we saw once the opposition leaders uh, started being prosecuted on political grounds. I have to mention that last week there was a decision of the European Court of Human Rights uh, suggesting that uh, the case against uh, Yuri Lusenko, former interior minister, was uh, politically motivated and that his arrest was not uh, done according to, uh, to the law. Uh, to international practices, but uh, the, the the fate of about 20 people from the previous administration is uh, clear that they will probably remain in prison and new cases against them will be uh, open. And of course that causes a lot of reaction, negative reaction from the European Union. Uh, at the moment the EU's line, and I, I would like to hear more more from you on this, uh, on the Irish position, is to release to, to the request to administration to release the opposition 
and hold the uh, free and fair parliamentary elections. Uh, also to conduct, to organize a constitutional and judicial reform. But I think that at this moment, the messages that come from the EU to Kiev, they are uh, quite mixed, mixed signals. Uh, and uh, part of the conditions that are put on Ukraine are um, difficult to implement again because for the administration it's too costly to release political prisoners for domestic reasons and too unclear what to do with uh, constitutional reform and uh, judicial reform because it's quite a comprehensive task and then can be interpreted in this or that way. Um, my fear is that the EU will have to re revise its policy on Ukraine. I'm not sure if the EU is ready for that because obviously we have very different views within the EU on what Ukraine is for the EU and what we want from the EU. And I think the first question is to to discuss what do we want from Ukraine and to start building policy from there. But at the moment, unfortunately, the uh, agreement, which has been negotiated for five years, is put on the shelf. And uh, the likelihood of it being unfrozen is very little, because obviously for the, uh, for the Ukrainian side, whereas the elections may be free and fair, and I'll talk about them in a minute if I mm -hmm. st still have time, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the fate of political prisoners is quite gloomy and I wouldn't see the Ukrainian administration making steps towards solution of this problem. So um, on the parliamentary elections, of the Ukraine will have parliamentary elections in October uh, this year. There are two good news about these elections. First of all, that the law that, was, uh, that will regulate the conduct of these elections was changed a year before the elections uh, and that's a good news for Ukraine because we usually try to do it just two or one week before the elections that have happened with the local elections in 2010. So the good news is that the rules are clear already for a year and that the OEC observers are already invited, which was a big concern and a question for the Ukrainian administration. Uh, but unfortunately there are many bad news or sad news. First of all, the return of this mixed system uh, for the elections, which means that 50% of the parliament will come through party lists, closed party lists, uh, and 50% will come uh, through uh, single mandated constituencies, as we call them in Ukraine. And this system may work well in some member states in the EU, but unfortunately the experience of Ukraine shows, uh, as Ukraine had that system in the 90s, that it's a system that is open to many manipulations and that it's a possibility of uh, rigging the elections. Uh, unfortunately, the way constituencies uh, for this single mandated people were broken down do not correspond with international norms and raise many questions by uh, domestic and international observers already. Uh, there is certain pressure on the media as I said, there is self-censorship, but also we will see that we see already that some media outlets are uh, enjoying certain pressure. Uh, and uh, basically the last but not least uh, bad news for Ukraine is that the opposition is pretty weak. It's not that it's weak in terms of numbers uh, or even public support, but it's weak in terms of uh, alternatives to the current administration and their connection with the public. And I think that there are three key questions for the elections. <coughs> One is to which extent the administration will use the um, administrative resource, basically pushing the local authorities to organize elections in a way that are comfortable for the, or beneficial for the um, party of regions. Uh, that was a funny development which, which uh, uh, comes from Russia, as we see, to put CCTVs in every uh, room where will be ele elections will be held. That's something that Putin introduced uh, before the last elections in Russia. And uh, again, here, while uh, the day of elections itself or the voting may not be problematic because people may still come and express their, their, uh, their <coughs> views, but the problem is that the counting may be problematic and we are not sure how much both the domestic and international observers will be able to, uh, to guarantee that the count is, uh, is fair. The second question and concern perhaps is that can elections be free and fair if the key opposition leaders are not running, even if their parties are participating in elections? 
but uh, can we can we consider this as uh, free and fair elections? Um, and the third question, which perhaps goes beyond the elections, because the question is what will happen after the elections? We may have more or less free and fair preparation, more or less free and fair vote and even count, and we may even have a lot of opposition people in the new parliament, but then the question is what will happen next? The, there are rumors in Kiev, uh, in the presidential administration, that the president wants to uh, change the constitution, and he tries to do that through quite legal means. He changed the constitution through the constitutional court, as I said, in 2010, and now the plan is more to do it through the parliament, so he needs a constitutional majority. Ukrainian parliament is unfortunately known for uh, people migrating between parties, but also being bought by bigger parties. So uh, the question is, will this parliament change the constitution to basically have the president be elected in the parliament, which means no, no people's participation in elections, with the same uh, wide competences and basically for a lifetime. So these are three questions that I think that are important for, to remember about the elections. I think it's too early to say whether the elections will be free and fair and we rely on OSC uh, report for that. But elections are not everything in Ukrainian reality uh, because they will not change whatever outcome is and whatever the process is, they will not change the systemic problems, basically Ukraine being in the grey zone between East and West, um, they will not go away. Just a few words on the people, um, because obviously uh, where are those Ukrainians who brought change in 2004-2005? Um, I think they are tired of politicians, they trusted too much to the Orange team and they did think that they would just bring these new politicians or they sought new politicians to power and then they would retreat home and they would let the good politicians deliver on their promises, which we all know didn't happen. Unfortunately, the people, both in the East and in the West, they disapprove of the government's actions and president's actions, but at the same time, they dislike the opposition, so the support for both sides is quite low. <coughs> uh, it, that may, of course, result also in the low turnout for the parliamentary elections. Uh, and people don't trust in their own power anymore. They did the, the revolution once and they cannot go and uh, protest every time. And uh, even if they go and protest, as we saw over the last two years, they will protest about something very important for them personally. When the administration suggested to adopt a tax legislation that, will, that would uh, influence negatively small and medium businesses, they went out to the streets but they w didn't go out to the streets, for instance, to protest when political opposition, uh, when, when the opposition was put behind the bars or other democratic problems appeared in Ukraine. Unfortunately, the authorities are trying to radicalize the population and the language law is one of the, one of the examples uh, of bringing East against the West of Ukraine because there is certainly a divide between Eastern and Western Ukraine, not uh, to the extent that uh, that some people in the West think, but obviously people have different culture, different language, different history, uh, different religion, and it's just 20 years that they have been together and they're still trying to find their way towards each other. But uh, adoption of language law, which basically is not really about the language, but about um, making society more, uh, more radical and more... Um, negative against each other is, is not a good sign. Um, and the hope, I think, is obviously in the young people uh, who, are, who are more believing in their power, but I think that there is still no critical mass of them who would uh, uh, know what they want from their country and who would know how to take this country there. And I think it will take time uh, for us to go there. And perhaps to, uh, to conclude, I will say just about the, the connection between Ukraine and Ireland, because as we discussed over lunch, uh, Ireland is holding an OSC chairmanship this year, and Ukraine will take over next year, which is perhaps a, a good news for Ukraine, even if it may be a bit of a difficult case for the OSC. Uh, but I think that uh, obviously Irish example of, um, of chairmanship could be uh, good for Ukraine. 
Uh, however, the, the results of uh, Ukrainian chairmanship is obviously still a big question and the priorities are. I think I'm done.